<clears throat> Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we return to our study in Judges 16 this week, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance, for his direction, and for his blessing? As we seek to understand this example that is presented and to make application of this example for what we are seeing currently occurring within our lives and within this movement at this time. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we have great need of you. We need you because we have sinned. We need your guidance. We need to come to understand that which you are showing to us. As we open your word today, we ask for your Holy Spirit to guide us, to help us to understand that which will be before us so that proper application may be made of the example that we are going to be addressing. These things are written for our admonition. We see this. Help us that we may accept this. May your angels attend us, Father. May we come to an understanding together. <clears throat> So that which we read, we may understand and apply for the time in which we live. And that we may be able <clears throat> to better explain these things to those with whom we come in contact. Help us now, direct us according to your will, so that we may come to understand your character more so that we may be clothed in your character and not in ours. For this, we thank you. And for this, we praise you now and always in Jesus name. Amen. Now as a bit of a recap, the Lords of the Philistines gathered them together for to offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon their God, and to rejoice, for they said, Our God hath delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hand. And when the people saw him, they praised their God, for they said, Our God hath delivered into our hands our enemy, and the destroyer of our country, who multiplied our slain. And it came to pass when their hearts were merry that they said, call for Samson, that he may make us sport. And they called for Samson out of the prison house and he made them sport and they set him between the pillars. Now, as we discussed at the outset of this study, the likelihood here is that Samson was more likely in his late 30s, possibly 38, maybe 39 years old. He had been judge of Israel for 20 years. But in that 20 year period, he had not been keeping the Nazarite vow. First, he sought to take as a wife a daughter of the Philistines. His wife and her father's house were destroyed by fire by others of the Philistines. He then leaves his area to go down to Gaza <clears throat> to visit a prostitute. Then he stays within his area in the Vale of Serek and enters into 
an unholy relationship with Delilah. But at the same time, as was pointed out within the spirit of prophecy, he partakes of the wine. Now, we've not gotten very far into <clears throat> all of the Nazarite vow, but the Nazarites were not to partake of the grape, of any of the wine, and they were not to partake of any dried grapes, which we would call raisins. Those symbols we may find to be very important as we continue through this study. But it's interesting that these admonitions were presented for those that would take the Nazarite vow. Now, on top of this, Samson's hair was not to have been cut. And we know that his hair was now divided in to at what the Bible would say was seven locks. We would likely call it seven braids. As the Philistines exalted over their great victory, they ascribed the honor to their gods, praising them as superior to the God of Israel. The contest, instead of be being between Samson and the Philistines, was now between Jehovah and Dagon. And thus the Lord was moved to assert his almighty power and his supreme authority. A favorable opportunity was soon presented. The Philistines held a feast in honor of their god Dagon. A vast company was assembled, and in the height of their sacrilegious festivities, they ordered the captive to be produced, that the people might have a new source of amusement. The multitude greeted the appearance with shouts of triumph and praised their God, who had thus subdued the destroyer of their country. Samson had been made sport of the people before, but now even the rulers of the nation mocked at his misery. So the lords of the Philistines of the five cities are attending this feast. The people are attending this feast. <clears throat> All are mocking at the misery of Samson. Now, in this situation, Samson has been held as a slave. He has been working at a grist mill. He is blind. He is poor. He is naked. But he is not forgotten. He is Laodicean in every sense but one. And Samson said unto the lad that held him by the hand, Suffer me that I may feel the pillars whereupon the house standeth, that I may lean upon them. At this point, what symbols can we see if this verse is turned in the ironic sense? Why is it important? Well, he's returning. To the, Go ahead. He's returning to the old path. Sorry, Dwight. He's returning to his first love. He's repenting and turning, turning to the old paths. How many times before had Samson repented of his follies? Well, he hadn't. The only time that he ever called unto God was after his victory from the rock. And he called because of his great thirst, right? Well, yes. So I guess that would be um, in 
Yeah. He had to understand there that his strength was not of himself. His strength was from God. Mm -hmm. Now, as, as is being pointed out here, he is returning to the old paths. What does this symbol show for us within the movement? Okay, so I'm, I'm having a bit of a trouble following how you're looking at this. Okay. Um, so here we have, because, uh, you know, the question was asked about the ironic um, interpretation. So the way that I understand this is we have uh, this moral story, which lies parallel with the ironic story, the ironic interpretation of this story. And the ironic interpretation is based upon the symbols that have presented themselves if we, as we've gone through this. Now, um, when he asks for his hands to be set upon between the pillars, we know already here that uh, Samson is, his hair has begun to grow again after he was shaven. And we still haven't decided exactly where we could put this on a line. Agreed. Now, now the pillars, um, if we're going to deal with the pillars in this moral story, uh, the pillars in the moral story are going to be taken down by Samson. And in the moral story, we don't take it ironically. So these pillars, um, the way that I had understood them, is that they represented uh, the teachings of Catholicism, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness. But we seem to be taking them here as the truths of, of Adventism, which I would only take in the ironic story. So, uh, I mean, these run parallel with each other. So, what is it that we're trying to say? Are we talking about the ironic story? Or are we talking about the moral story? Well, okay. In this verse that's before us, Samson is speaking unto the lad that held him by the hand. Mm -hmm. Now, We were addressing on Thursday that this situation, being led by another, mm -hmm. could also be applied with Peter, because we have that example in the Bible as well. Mm -hmm. We also have Christ being led, but he is led by Lazarus as he rides on the ass into Jerusalem. Uh -huh. We've said that Samson is a type of Christ. Uh -huh. So this lad that is leading a blind man who is being mocked, if we turn this on its head. So you're going to look at the ironic story then. I'm looking at the ironic story. They would not be mocking the blind man. They would be cheering. Right? Um, no. Okay. So I'm, That's not how I would look at the story ironically. So, so we don't just take every aspect and turn it upside down. Okay. Right? Um, So well, let's first look at the moral story. So the moral story, this is dealing with the Sunday law. We would agree with that. No, no disagreement. We're fine in our time. And the Sunday law is the cross. 
I believe we made that application. Right. So, so if we're applying this to Christ, if we're going to deal with Christ's line, I mean, this is going to represent the cross. But what happens before the cross? Well, he's he's led to the cross. Right. He's led into Jerusalem. He's led to the cross. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So we would put that there in the moral story. And in the moral story, then, uh, this represents Christ dying, right? Samson is representing Christ dying. We will we'll get to that part of it, but we're not there yet. Yeah, but 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 Samson represents Christ ironically, which we which we agree upon. Yes. So now, though, if we're going to apply it uh, to Christ in the ironic sense, I mean, we don't have people cheering Christ. No, in in this situation, that's why I was asking if we're turning this upside down yeah because when he came into jerusalem he was being cheered as son of david oh okay i see what you're you're trying to say here so you're saying that that this is okay i understand what you're saying now okay i would agree then all right right so yeah so we're applying it to christ um ironically and this so and and that's how we're applying it so in, in a sense there's three different levels in which we can look at this at least exactly right so we have the moral story and the moral story is samson's bad and he does in the end though have a type of victory but he he symbolizes christ ironically and so we all agree upon that so that story is about Christ. But then when we look at the symbols that are attached to this story, we can see that they apply to our time. And, and we can apply it, of course, um, the story of Delilah, we can apply it to the first, second, and third angel's messages and the fourth angel's message as understood in the line of Ellen White, how Ellen White would look at uh, the line of the three angels' messages and the fourth. But we also can take it and apply it directly to our line in the movement itself. And that's because we have all these symbols that point to that. So when we do that, we don't take every element and, and turn it upside down. Uh, we're not looking at some point where, for instance, in this movement, we're being cheered. And right. I think that can be a little bit confusing, keeping track of all these different lines and different stories. But yes, if we're taking Samson to represent Christ, then this mocking that occurs here would be uh, the hosannas on, on that Sunday before the crucifixion. The point that, that had been made, I thought, very clearly was this last week. The, the positives are not ironic, but the negatives can be applied in the ironic. Yeah. So when I look at this as an example, so that we can come to a clearer understanding as a group, this situation with Samson being led by the lad that held him by the hand is not in the positive. It is a negative in mm -hmm. the moral story. Yeah. <clears throat> so the purpose to address this in this way is to give the support that when we're looking at the moral story, mm -hmm. we've identified a negative. Mm -hmm. When we look at the story in the ironic, since this is a negative, we can turn it to a positive and see another application from the life of, of Christ. Right. Yes. Now we, as we're looking at the moral story, we can also now make a clearer application to this being the time where the final Sunday law is applied. 
because this is one where a group sees those keeping the Sabbath as the troubler of the land. Uh -huh. So in this, in this sense, we have now identified three different lines that we can take from these applications within the book of Judges. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Now, Samson is saying, suffer me that I may feel the pillars upon which the house standeth. We have made the application in the moral story that these pillars, these two pillars specifically, would be Sunday sacredness and the immortality of the soul, or as some would say, the state of the dead. Yeah. The pillars of error. The pillars of error. Exactly. Yeah. How would... Yeah, because in the moral story, Dagon is obviously uh, a representative of the papacy. Yeah, there's just something fishy about him. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, now, <clears throat> do we make an application of this, of the pillars in relation to the Adventist church. Well, if, if we're going to take this story, um, we would have to be the one dealing with the three angels' messages and the fourth to deal with the pillars as representing the truths of Adventism. So that'd be Ellen White's line of the, the messages. Okay, so Ellen White's line of the messages identifies a fourth line, correct? A, a fourth um, angel? Fourth, a fourth line. Well, well, that would be, okay, so you have the line of Christ, which is just taking this moral story, turning it on its head and applying it to Christ. And then you have the line dealing with the first, second, and third angel's message and the fourth, right? So that's Ellen White's line, what I call her line. Okay. And... And then we have um, the, the story that applies to this movement, right? So we, we can apply it to this movement um, in the applications of the messages. Uh, we can also zoom in a little bit on that as well. So there's two different ways we can apply it to our line. I don't know. Does that answer your question? Well, I'm just, <clears throat> I'm just trying to identify this because what we were, what we were looking at is we have a moral line. Mm -hmm. We, I think we understand that clearly. We have an ironic line of Christ. Of Christ. We have a, a line that we can apply for our time, which I believe we said was the third line. Okay. I see. And then as you're, as you're bringing this out, there is a line in reference to Mrs. White. Now, is the line in reference with Mrs. White the third line, or is this a fourth line? Well, okay. So the moral line, I didn't count as a line. So I'm just talking about the applications we make of it. So we make these applications, the ironic, applying to Christ. And then we have two or three other applications that we can apply. So, so the line of Ellen White is just how she sees the three angels' messages and the fourth. So we, we've done that one already. I don't know how to put them in order, which one. I mean, that would be more zoomed out. And as we look at these lines, they zoom in as we get to more closer to our time. Right. Um, but there is, there's definitely altogether five lines. If you're going to take that, just the straightforward moral line. Okay. Because we have a line that we apply to, um, just like Ellen White's line, and we have the repeat of history. So we can go from 1989 
the, we could call it Jeff's line if you wanted to call it that way. Um, and then if, but we also have this line which applies to our 777 structure, like more immediate to what's happened in this movement. Right. And that has a first, second, third, and a fourth as well. We haven't really defined that all completely. But we're going to be working on that in, in this next week and possibly next. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, the, the reason that I'm being specific about this on identifying lines, mm -hmm. the purpose with this, with these, with our studies, has been so that as we are studying, we come to a clearer understanding of what's being presented before us. Much of what we're finding within the book of Judges, we're going to have to be able to explain to others. Mm -hmm. Now, if, we, if we're looking at this and we're saying, okay, there's a, a moral line and there's an ironic line and we leave it from there, then when we're addressing other points that come from other lines, it would look as if we're not really understanding our subject. Right. Yeah, and, and the purpose of this study, I mean, this study is called Understanding the Lines. So, I mean, the whole reason that we've been going through this history in this way is to be, to be able to take these stories and, and see how they relate to the lines. But the thing that we've known We've always known that these lines are parallels, right? We can take the line of Christ, it's a pattern. We can take the line of the Millerites, uh, and it's, it's a pattern. And we already knew that 1989 is repeating the history of the Millerites, that, that big line we often call it. You know, we don't usually call it Ellen White's line, but I, I call it Ellen White's line because that's how she sees Revelation 18, as the fourth angel it's a part of that first second and third angels message but we also know that that exists within our movement that we have a repeat of the first and second angels message within our movement that's going to end ultimately to the close of probation and then to the second coming of christ and it has within it the sunday law now when we were looking at these in 2017 and 2018 trying to sort out these lines Parminder had taken something Jeff had done and really uh, messed it up. And, and that was this, this staggering of these lines of the priest Levites and the Nethanim, which to me never made any sense because we didn't see anything like that in Millerite history. And, and the point that Jeff was doing really there is he was seeing how the lines are typical, that each way mark is typical of another but he didn't know how to put it together. And Parminder took what he did, got rid of the typical nature of the waymark, saying that waymarks don't typify each other, and, um, and then created this, this false uh, system of lines that looked nothing like Millerite history. We had no precedent in it, um, and tried to pass it off as the lines. And that still has affected this movement. What we should see now is that we, we can sort out the lines much more readily by recognizing how we're, what level we're zoomed into, I think is uh, maybe the key, and to understand what way mark we are zooming into. So, in, I mean, you have lots of different applications. That is, Samson, his story can illustrate every other line, right? because every line is the same. And so we can apply it to the line of Christ, which we already had. We can apply it to the line of the, what we call the big line. We can apply it to our repeat of history. But if that's true, we can apply it to any line and specifically to the line that we already recognize uh, within this movement. That is, we have recognized uh, that uh, 11 9, 19, November 9th, 2019, is 
a way mark which we would line up with what way mark? What, where would we put November 9th, 2019? What have we attached it to internally within the movement? I thought August 11th, 1840. Um, okay, so November 9th, 19, or 2019, how about? Well, didn't we come to an, didn't have in the Millerite line, wasn't that a, an impetus to a greater understanding and trust of the Bible. Yeah. So, I mean, it's kind of a trick, trick question because we've okay. applied it differently at different times. So we have applied November 9th, 2019 to the first day of the first month. Okay. That is, we've applied it to the first disappointment. <clears throat> and we have also applied July 18th to October 22nd, 1844, to the Great Disappointment, right? So we have done that. But November 9th, 2019, has different applications depending on where we're zooming in. Because when in, in October 13th, when we had um, uh, October 13th, 2018, and we marked that as the Midnight Cry, then November 9th, 2019 would have to be um, a type of the Sunday law, right? So, so the problem is that we still have, when we're looking at these different lines, we have multiple way, lines within our own line. And, and so this, this has become a problem. Now, we also have marked November 9th, 2019, as midnight, right? So we marked it as midnight, even though we already had October 13th as the midnight cry. So we marked November 9th as midnight and July 18th as the midnight cry. So this was in what line? What line were, were we looking at when we did that? And, and we had the, seven, the end of the 777, December 25th, 2021, as the Sunday law. So what line were we in when we did that? I'm not trying to confuse people. Would that be in the big line? Well, it's definitely not in the big line because in the big line, none of this history is part of the big line. So Ellen White has the big line. She has the arrival of the third angel's message, October 22nd, 1844. And the next event is the Sunday law, which is Revelation 18. So she doesn't have uh, 1989 or 911 or any of these other events. So it, it's definitely not the big line. But it, it is a line that Jeff had structured, right? So remember Jeff had taken... Um, because he kept zooming in as, as he moved along in the understanding of things. So he had 9-11 as the first day of the first month, right? In 2016, uh, um, September, sep September 11th, 2001 is the first day of the first month, right? All right. Okay. And he had October 22nd, 1844 which is the 10th day of the seventh month, he had lined up with the Sunday law. And we now in 2016 had two way marks in between these other way marks because he always had had um, uh, three way marks prior to that, right? You know, um, he would have 1989, uh, the Sunday law, the close of probation at first. And then after 9-11, he would have um, 1989, 9-11, and then the Sunday law, the Sunday law being the close of probation. So he was zooming in 
as we continue to move through these lines. But we weren't really aware of that that's what we were doing. But in 2016, because we had introduced the midnight way mark, so we, in 2015, we had the first day of the first month, right? That's going to be April 19th, 1844, was lined up with September 11th, 2001. And then we had, of course, the Sunday law was still October 22nd, 1844, the close of probation for Adventists. That was going to be the Sunday law. And we had the midnight cry the first day of the fifth month, because we had come to understand that uh, quite thoroughly in 2014. Um, so we had that as the center way mark. But in 2016 now, we had midnight. We, we now had midnight and the midnight cry in between the first day of the first and the Sunday law. Right, so we had this for now a different structure. Okay, so Daniel, your mic keeps coming on. We're getting lots of noise. I'm not sure what's going on there. Right, so so you see that we now had something different. We had this midnight in the why in between. Um, the first day of the first month and the tenth day of the seventh month. But, so, so then we, we would put we would when we were making these predictions. Now, we put November 9th as midnight and July 18th as the midnight cry, and December 25th, 2021 became the Sunday law, right? So, what line were we in? When we did that, what way mark were we zooming in on? Well, if we've eliminated the big line, which from your definition eliminates Ellen White's line. Yeah. We have set aside, I would think, the ironic line. So are we not dealing with the moral line? No, no, that's not the question I'm asking. Okay. Because, so Jeff had this line, right? He had okay. a line that had September 11th, 2001, and then he's looking for these two way marks, midnight and the midnight cry. And in this movement, we're always talking about when, when is midnight? What event's going to mark it? And when we came up with November 9th, that, that was midnight that we were looking for, right? But we didn't really know what line we were in. That is, we didn't know where we were zoomed in. Now, then we ended up with July 18th. Now, Tess and Parminder, they didn't want to have anything to do with July 18th. They didn't want the midnight cry to be in uh, 2020. They were looking at 2021 as a date for the midnight cry. And they actually were teaching that we couldn't even know the date for the midnight cry until we got to November 9th. That's what they were teaching. Um, so this idea of July 18, 2020 uh, didn't fit in with the structure that they had proposed. So, so then we, we experienced these things. We experienced November 9th, which we would see would be analogous with the first disappointment. And then July 18th would have been uh, this uh, disappointment that we had lined up with, and, and it didn't make sense to me, but I understood it. Um, that is, we were experiencing the, the disappointment of the Millerites, but we were experiencing it at the midnight cry way mark that Jeff had set up. And, and people didn't seem to have an explanation for that. But, but I had an explanation, and the explanation was is that July 18th, 1844, which is the prediction before midnight, typifies October 22nd, 1844. And so when we experienced July 18th, we were experiencing, um, we were on a different line than we thought we were on. That is, we weren't on the, we weren't expecting then the Sunday law to come on December 25th, 2021. We were looking at things internally. And, and that wasn't really 
well received or well understood by others. And, and, I, and I put it in a paper dealing with July 18th, um, but the whole point of the paper was missed out. That is the typical nature of our line and what we were. So we were zoomed into a waymark, but the question is what waymark were we zoomed into when we were dealing with these, the 777 structure? And, and I don't think that, that many people would know what that is. This is, this is one of those examples that I think will be better presented on a board, on a whiteboard. Right, yeah. So, so we're going to go through that. I mean, I, I don't want to do it right now. But all I can say is that um, when we zoom into a waymark, uh, just like when we zoom into the Sunday law on the big line, that zooming into the Sunday law is this whole history of this movement from 1989 to the Sunday law, right? All right. That is, Ellen White has this Sunday law way mark, it's Revelation 18. And, and we just looked at it as one event, you know, one day the Sunday law is going to come. But this movement started an increase of light. It repeated the first and second angels' messages in order that it could, uh, prepare Adventism for the Sunday law. And that be, that line still exists, that line from 1989 to the Sunday law. Agreed. But we're not at the Sunday law. No. Line is a zoom into it. Now, within that line, we have these different waymarks. We have 1989. We have 9-11. We have a thing called midnight and a thing called the midnight cry. And... At some point, when we zoom into these waymarks, we're going to end up with another line. Now, basically, yeah, the way that the way that this is going to be approached mm -hmm. is through this week, we're going to be taking the different points that you're making right now. Mm -hmm. We're going to put them so that we can we can properly identify the big line christ line mm -hmm. our line everything else that we're going to see that all of these lines rather than being separated as you were pointing out as parminder and tess had done yeah that these very much are all interrelated Mm hmm. Yeah. And so so we're zoomed into uh, the midnight waymark or or more specifically, this movement has been about the prediction before midnight. Right. Right. And that is everything that this movement about is about is a, the approaching of midnight. And, so now, and yeah. So as, as we return to this, as we're going through these examples, mm -hmm. we're going to lay these examples out so that this portion of the study can elicit the elements of what is going to need to be placed upon a line. Mm -hmm. So that as we're looking at this whether we're looking at it morally, ironically, big line, our line, whatever line of the, of the potential of five lines, we can then more properly understand where we are in terms of our current history as we are examining the Millerite history. Right. Yeah, and because that's what we, and Samson is giving us in this story a very good illustration of how to understand the lines. Okay. Right? So that's why, I mean, you know, we're going to not just draw out the line of Samson, though I think we might start with Samson's line and then sort of work our way out to the whole story of the judges and how that fits in. Uh, because in some ways, Samson's line is an overview of all of the lines. 
what we may need to do is to go back to line back out Judges chapter two and then return to Samson's so that we can place more of the points so that it's as we're looking, I mean, as we've established, Judges chapter two basically gives us a, a type of waymark for each year of this movement from 2000 forward. Right, yeah. And I, I, what I would like to do is actually zoom back out slowly to get to that bigger picture. But what I'm saying is that we may need that, that construction so okay. that we, we can use it more as a point of reference. Okay. But we'll see how we end up doing it. Okay. I, I sort of had a plan of what I wanted to do. All right. So, Question. Yes, please. If Jeff in the beginning I had three way maps, so what about these two way maps of increase of an Oregon formalization of the city? 1991 and 1996. Did you understand what he said? No. Yeah, I, I couldn't understand what you were saying, Daniel. If Jeff had three way marks in the beginning. Yeah, Jeff had way marks in the beginning. Yeah. What about the increase of knowledge, 1996? The formalization of message, 1996, and increase of knowledge, 1991. Okay, I didn't catch the last part. So he had these lines in the beginning, and these lines have been, he's been zooming in as we pass through history. What are you asking about the lines that Jeff had? Jeff, you told, I've been listening to the videos. Yeah. That Jeff, that Jeff had in the beginning, three way marks. Way marks, yeah. Yeah, he had three way marks. Yeah. Uh, that is time of end, standard law, and the close of profession. But mm -hmm. I see another two way marks increase of knowledge and formalization of the message, like 1991 and 1996. But each, each of those three way marks, Daniel, would have likely been part of the what Theodore is referring to as the big. Yeah, well, here, here's how I would understand it. So what, what Jeff did is he understood that the everlasting gospel is a three-step testing prophetic message. And so he had these three way marks from Millerite history, the first angel's message, the second angel's message, the third angel's message. And when he lined them up with our history, you know, he had the arrival of the first angel's message in 1798. So he had that in 1989. That's going to be the time of the end. But 1989, he also attached to August 11th, 1840. So, so in, so Jeff wasn't really, he wasn't aware that he was zooming in as he passed through history. So, so he had these three way marks, 1989, uh, the Sunday Law and the Close of Probation. That's his first uh, illustration of the lines. But as time went on, the Sunday Law became the Close of Probation because he saw that the Sunday Law was the Close of Probation. And then as 9-11 passed, then he would have, instead of the time of the end starting the line, he would have 9-11 starting the line and the Sunday Law at the end as the third one and then he had as the center, he had the midnight cry. And then, and then we just kept filling in. We, we now had midnight and the midnight cry was a doubling. So in a sense, those two way, way marks, midnight and the midnight cry, were really one way mark because that's how they were understood in Millerite history. They didn't even really make a distinction between Boston and Exeter. They just conflated them into one way mark. Sometimes people referred to Boston. Sometimes they referred to Exeter, 
and 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 mostly they got the two confused that is they they just had them as one story details regarding boston and details regarding exeter were conflated into one story about the midnight cry and it took us a long time to sort out that they were separate events and and to figure out their dates and their relations to the lines so so in a sense we still always have a, a three-step testing prophetic message but we we recognize that midnight and the midnight cry are a doubling of the second angel's message and that is we also understood that there was other way marks as we looked at these different lines that is each way mark had three steps to it and then we could zoom into each of those steps and see three way marks again so i hope that answers your question daniel because i'm not sure if i fully understood your question you want some okay okay <clears throat> Samson is now looking to lean upon the pillars. So in a manner of, of speaking, he's casting off his reliance upon the hand of the lad. And he is now leaning upon the pillars. Now, as we're looking at this from the moral aspect, as we will determine in a moment, as we read the verses, that the main pillars that are supporting the house, we would see this as Sunday sacredness and the state of the dead, or, you know, as, as Mrs. White would call it, <clears throat> the Now, now my mind has gone blank. Immortality of the soul. Thank you. Yes. That's the error. So we cover from here, we, as we continue, that the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there. So church and state and the rulers are there. We have the symbols for all of this, right? Mm -hmm. And there were upon the roof about 3,000 men and women that beheld while Samson made sport. Now, what's important about the roof? Why is this symbol, this roof, being mentioned? I mean, when I'm, when I'm looking at this using Strong's numbering, I'm looking at Hebrew 1406. And the word I believe would be pronounced as Gog. And according to this, they're thinking that it's a reduplication of Hebrew 1342, or the analogy that this is the top of the altar. So, what can we see from this symbol, this roof? I mean, we've, we, we see that there are 3,000 men and women. That's quite a bit to have on a roof. But that's also 10 times Gideon's 300. So this, this is a massive structure. We're talking about something that, that 
can, if there's 3,000 people on the roof, there would likely be about 3,000, possibly more, within the, the main part of the structure. It can also connect the number 3,000 to Pentecost. Excellent. Because there was about 3,000 that were baptized on that day of Pentecost, right? Yes. So the house was full of men and women with the lords of the Philistines. So I don't know if we, if we can make the application that this is a positive or a negative, or if this is a neutral description, but could we turn this upside down? Because they beheld while Samson was making sport, was made sport of. What do you think? I see them as ha taking the highest place for themselves and they're going to be brought down as right. promised. And that fits within the moral line. That fits very well. Can we, can we turn this into a portion of the ironic line? Do we make the application, as Stephen was pointing out, that this was very much like the baptism on the day of Pentecost? Is this a representation of those that will hear the message, since Samson is a message, when they understand, and they'll take it when they understand the message? Yeah, I think we can make that application. Okay. So... The message that was being given as Christ was led in to Jerusalem was Hosanna to the son of David. Samson as a message is explaining the gospel in its purity combined with chronology. It's showing the people where they stand. It's giving them the lines in a greater clarity than they have ever seen before. Would that be a correct application? it seems that it could be applied okay okay so so when we're looking at, at this story uh, just in the moral story of, of samson i mean he's typifying the sunday law and he's he's um taking down these pillars right right and and this is going to be uh the message of the loud cry that's going to bring in all of these people that are going to be saved, right? Right. Now, uh, so, but when we're doing that, we're taking this story of Samson because this is about the destruction of the enemies. So we're, we're applying it, we're applying this moral story and we're applying it then to the bigger line, a, a, ironically, right? Right. So, so this taking down of 3,000, becomes a parallel to Pentecost only when we look at it ironically. I would agree. Okay, okay. Um, now, 
that, and that would be in, if we're applying it to the time of Christ, um, we would then apply it to Pentecost itself. Is that what we're saying? Well, that the three thousand are the fruit of the cross and the preaching of the, the disciples, the work of the Holy Spirit. I see that as as one way of approaching. Yeah. So so we can apply it to Christ. The three thousand would represent the three thousand baptized. Okay. Okay. Now um, now the two middle middle pillars uh, in the time of Christ. What would those be representing? Is it just representing? Uh, is it representing, let's say, the, the thieves on the cross or something like that? No. Okay. So what would the middle pillars be? I think it has to be something larger than the thieves on the cross. Okay. I, I, well, well, the thieves on the cross represent something. They represent the two classes of worshipers. Okay. I'm I'm not disagreeing with that. So that that that's not something very small. I'm not talking about them literally as people. Uh, but the cross of Christ occurs in the middle. It's a chiasm. And and you know the chiasm exists, of course, as a period of the 2520. We could say maybe it has to do with some prophetic periods. Uh, the pillars could refer to the 70 weeks in the 2520 or something like that too. I think that's a better application. Okay. Because one of the things that we have been we have been determining is that throughout our situation within within the corporate church, many of the understandings that the pioneers had had been set aside. And there were things that have come to replace this at least within the minds of the corporate church, where the message that we were to be giving has been obfuscated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so we know that Christ is, is slain in the midst of his symbolic 2520. Mm -hmm. And, and, that, and that's, that's the chiasm there for the cross. Um, I don't know if I would disconnect it, though, from the two thieves, because they represent the two classes of worshipers. But, but I understand your point. Um, you know, because Jesus is crucified literally in a chiasm. Uh, right. There's a mirror on one side, those that are saved and those that are lost um, on either side of that. Um, but we also, you know, if you're going to try to define two middle pillars um, as being doctrines, or because usually prophecy is a foundation, though it can be connected to a pillar. Why couldn't it? Why couldn't it be the disconnect of prophecy and the abandoning of the twenty-five twenty? Okay, in in the time of Christ. No, I'm I'm speaking within the church. Yeah, but I'm trying to talk about in the time of Christ. What are the two middle pillars? Well, what the major thing that the Sadducees had, they did not believe in a resurrection. Okay. Okay. That, that fits then in our application when we apply it to the Sunday law. Right. And then you've got the Pharisees. And wasn't the Pharisees' reliance upon man's laws rather than God's laws? Right. So you could still have the Sabbath there, the true application of the law, and the state of the dead in that sense in the time of Christ. Technically, yeah. Right. And Christ resting in the tomb on the Sabbath and coming up in the resurrection illustrates both of those truths. Exactly. Okay. Okay. So that, that makes much more sense. And it helps align with how we're making the application to our time at the Sunday law.
Yeah, right. The resurrection was kind of like a showcase thing for him, you know, Lazarus and uh, the Tabitha and those things. So that it relates. Yeah. So we're able to make these applications in the time of Christ, in this story with Samson. And I think we're going to be able to do the same thing in the ironic line as well in relation to what we're dealing with, with ourselves and with the church. I mean, one of the pillars of current Adventist worship has been the disconnect from prophecy with the gospel. As we were addressing yesterday, was there not a prophecy at the time of Elijah? Was there not a prophecy that was fulfilled in the time of Noah? Was there not a prophecy that was fulfilled in the time of Moses? Was there not a prophecy fulfilled with John the Baptist? All of these events were chronological in basis, but had their foundation in prophecy. By the time we come to 1919, we have people such as W.W. Prescott that have decided that they don't want to preach the 2300 days ever again. They just want to deal with the nature and the beauty of Christ. They don't want to apply the prophecy whatsoever. And this goes in line with, with what I've seen from several Adventist churches that, well, we don't want to deal with prophecy. We don't want to deal with the figures that are presented within Revelation 18. We even want to set aside the understanding of the lake of fire, because this is just daddy taking us to the lake. And that, to me, has always been a very fearsome thought. Because not only are you setting aside who Christ is, you're accepting a false Christ in this representation. So, and Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. You have two pillars, you have two eyes. But how many different references are used here in this verse? for Lord and for God. Samson is making multiple references to different portions of the character of our almighty creator. I mean, when I'm, when I'm looking at this, the first reference, he called unto the Lord. He called unto Jehovah, Hebrew 3068, and said, O Lord God, O Adonai, Yehovi, remember, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once. So as he's praying, is this not a doubling? I pray thee, and then I pray thee. Only this once, O God, O Elohim, O Supreme One, that I may be avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. 
for my two ayin. So why is he using so many different types of references in this prayer? What symbolically can we see here? Is Samson not recognizing the Godhead? As we have three angels' messages, is he not recognizing that this is a unified group with one purpose? That he is recognizing the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So here, as it continues, and Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood and on which it was borne up, or, and he leaned on them, one of the one with his right hand and the other with his left. one with the north and the other with the south. One conservative, one liberal. How else should we look at this? How else can we apply this? Now we've done it, we've done a nice job identifying what these pillars would be depending on the line that we're looking at. Okay, so um, so so the interesting thing here is um, Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood, um, and here so this is not just the roof; this is uh, more structural than that. Right. Okay, and on which it was borne up. Right. So it's lifted up on these. And now he has one in his right hand and the other in his left. And the right hand and the left hand can refer to north and south. Correct. Right. Agreeable. Yeah. So now the other thing is this is Judges 1629. Now... Okay. Uh, Odilio brought this out in his study of, of the mandates. And 1629 has some interesting characteristics. If you subtract 911, you get 718, which is, of course, July 18th. Right. If you add 391, you get 2020, in which July 18 occurred. Uh, I think there was something else he did with it. I just can't remember offhand. Um, um, 360. Ah, right. Yeah, so if you subtract 360. No, if you add 360. Oh, add. Oh, you get 1989. Yeah. So, so, so you have these... Um, these symbols that come from this. So we can take this 1629 to represent uh, something that's happening in our time. 
Now, if we take the two middle, middle pillars, um, could we take that as representing midnight in the midnight cry? That would be an interesting application. Yeah. We also add an application of the message of the king of the north and the message of the king of the south. Okay. Um, I can't remember exactly all the details of that. Um, but it could represent to the messages of the north and the south. Um, it, it could represent other things. Yeah, and of course, uh, this reference to Exodus 16.29. So we can take a verse like this in Judges, and we can look at this verse in other places. So in Exodus 16.29, it says, See, for that the Lord hath given you the Sabbath, therefore he giveth you the sixth day, the bread of two days. Abide ye every man in his place, that then no man go out of his place on the seventh day. Now this, of course, is addressing the manna. And we already have addressed this span in which the man is given um, relating to our lines. Um, but there was also um, Leviticus 16.29. And in Leviticus 16.29, it says, And this shall be a statute forever unto you, that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, ye shall afflict your souls and do no work at all whether it be one of your own country or a stranger that sojourneth among you. So here we have the Day of Atonement being referenced, the 10th day of the seventh month, which would also relate to the Sunday law, right? October 22nd, 1844 symbolizes the Sunday law. Okay. And, and then in Numbers 1629, I believe it is, um, if these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. Now, I didn't quite understand Odilio's application of this verse. Um, so I, I think he was using it as a type of close of probation. He was taking, he didn't use the Exodus one. I believe he used just the, the numbers and Leviticus ones. Of 1629, but he was somehow applying this to uh, maybe so somehow to the to the pandemic, to the vaccination, the mandates in some way as well. It, it never made sense to me, so I'm not sure if I can even really express what he said. It was also 1629 days from when Ezekiel began to prophesy until the siege began. Right, yeah. So Stephen has noticed, noted that. Um, so he begins to prophesy that's going to be uh, uh, Ezekiel 1 verse 1 until the start of the siege, which is going to be mentioned in Ezekiel, uh, is it 24? Um, yeah, I think so. Yeah, so in Ezekiel 24, because, yeah that he's going to mention the date of the siege and have him note it, right? <clears throat> okay, now from the chat, it the was election. the application of Exodus 1629, which reads, See for that the Lord hath given you the Sabbath, therefore he giveth you on the sixth day the bread of two days. Abide ye every man in his place, let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. Right. Now that's one. But 1629 in history on March 4th was also the founding of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Okay. So it ties into what was going on within America as well. Okay. Yeah, so there's so there's lots of things about this 1629 that we can look at that relates to this movement and to the past that relates to Ezekiel, it ties Ezekiel. And, and then we're tied to the siege. Now, um, have we ever looked at 1629 days in our lines? Have we ever come up with anything regarding this period of, as a period of time? 
No. However, if if we go on beyond Exodus, and you looked at Leviticus 16.29, it brings us to the time, the heavenly time in which we are currently living. The Day of Atonement, yeah. Yep. So I think that 16.29 is a symbol that we might want to explore a little more. Yeah. Well, I do know that it's a period of four years and 180, 168 days. So okay. I've never heard that before. Um, 1629 days is four years on the Julian calendar. So it's, uh, yeah, 1451 um, uh, times, um, let me see here. Yeah, so it's 1541. Is that right? Hang on. Yeah, 1461 plus 168. So there's 1461 days in a um, four year period on the Julian calendar. And if you add this 168, you get 1629. So 168, there's 168 hours in a week. Right. Okay. So, so four years is also a symbol, right? Jeff, the Jeff had looked at in right. the number. Four. But I, I haven't put sixteen twenty nine anywhere um, in our lines, like sixteen hundred and twenty nine days that I can think of. Okay. So, so maybe that's something we could look at at some point. Um, I just don't know where I would put it. Anyway. That that's that's the input I have on sixteen twenty nine. This point. Okay. Okay. Now we have six minutes remaining in today's study. We're going to cover a little bit more, but we're going to have to return to quite a bit of this tomorrow. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood, and on which it was borne up, of the one with his right hand and of the other with his left. Now, when we're speaking of a structure where a man can reach with one hand and then to the other. We're talking that these pillars are probably about six feet apart, maybe less. But he's, he's choosing the central pillars, the foundational pillars of this structure. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might. And the house fell upon the lords and upon the people that were therein. So the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. The leaders, the people, the priests. All of these are dying along with Samson. So we have the 3,000 that are on the roof. We have those that are inside, which may be more than 3,000. We don't know. We're not told. But we know that 
all of this is more than Samson slew in his life. But why, why would the alternate Hebrew say, let my soul die with the Philistines? Would this, would this be a recognition of the resurrection? And in this situation, as we have, as we've looked at this at times, ironically, is this not another recognition in Christ's line? Would we say that Judges 1630 is negative or would we say that it's positive? Well, I mean, he's committing suicide in, in a sense, right? So he's, he's choosing to die. Christ chose to die. Right. Um, but, you know, here this, this would be, I mean, it's, it's a positive negative in that he has submitted himself to God. Now, when he says, uh, let my soul die, well, I mean, that would just be the normal expression. Um, there's nothing. I don't know why they have it as let me. I mean, that's my soul. My soul die. Um, I'm just trying to figure out here, but why they translate it this way. So the my soul is just a reference of referring to yourself. Um, like you're saying it's, it's suicide, but uh, God's giving him the strength. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, that's why I say it's a positive negative. I mean, it, it. I mean, he's killing himself. He's choosing to die, and in that sense, it's suicide. But he has given himself to God, and God is with him. So I'm not saying, you know, he's like somebody's committing suicide out of despair. But I'm just saying it's... Um, uh, it's being done to the glory of God. Yes. But it's still, in a, in a sense, he's killing himself, right? It's a self-sacrifice. It's like a suicide bomber or a kamikaze pilot in that sense. I mean, they're doing it for a purpose. But it doesn't change the fact that he's killing himself. I mean, th that he knows he's going to die by this act. You know, and and somebody compared it like, well, somebody going to war. Well, when somebody goes to war, they try not to die. Right. I mean, they don't go to war with the intention they're going to die. So they're not. That's pretty much the suicide. objective. <clears throat> the, the objective is to stay alive. Right. So. But people do die in wars. They take a risk. That's right. And I'm not committing suicide if I die in a car accident because I knew I had a chance of dying in a car accident because you always have that chance. Um, but here in this sense, we have a positive negative. Um, but he is typifying Christ in the sense that he's giving up his life freely. Mm. Right? So... I mean, that's been noted by, by many people. But it's also, you know, often said that he's committing suicide. So it, it is self-sacrifice, I guess, if you wanted to look at it that way, as Iran has said. Which, which you could say of Christ. Okay. Now, we have come to the end of our study today. In our, of our time together. We're going to be returning to several points of this to address this in the morning. Do we have any other thoughts or comments at this point? No, we can just pick this up tomorrow. Okay. Shall we then close with prayer?
loving Father in heaven. We thank you for this time that we've been able to spend together, that we have been able to reason these things together, addressing them, considering others' views, and considering this which is presented before us. Please direct us this day. Guide us, we ask, so that that which is done may bring glory to your name, to your character, and to the work that you would have us to do. Prepare us, please. Help us to understand that which we are to say and to do among those that you would have us provide outreach to. Be with us now. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.